Hi and welcome to today's Ask EMBN. On today's show we're going to be looking at e-cargo bikes and trailers, both great ways to get your shopping in and also giving you a workout at the same time. And remember, more shopping, more workout. Right, first question coming in from Colin O'Neill. He's saying, how do you find the Levo SL for power? I've just got a new expert and I'm a little bit disappointed. There is no difference between trail and turbo when climbing. Wow, that's that's a real shame there, Colin, because, uh, well, thinking about it, the Levo SL is actually quite a different bike to the Levo. Obviously, there's 30 newton meters of power on the Levo SL and 90 newton meters on the Levo, so it's quite a significant difference. Uh, but the Levo SL was never meant to replace the Levo. It's actually quite a different bike. In many ways, it's like a stepping stone bike uh, to, to e-biking, if you like. Um, I'm thinking whether you've actually got the, uh, the settings turned down in turbo mode because it actually is quite a significant jump from trail mode up to turbo. So have a look at mission control and hopefully uh, that will sort it out. Uh, same question here is from Keith Hurley. Now Keith is 40 years old getting back into mountain biking and looking to buy his first e-mountain bike with about 4,000 euros to spend. Uh, Keith looks like you're looking at a, gi a giant or a high bike. Uh, you're asking for any recommendations and preferably 140 mil travel for for everyday riding. Chris, uh, some both good bikes there, right? Yeah, definitely got some great brands in there. Giant and High Bike. Giant actually run their own version of the Yamaha motor, so it's a really good motor. High Bike obviously gonna be running Bosch and Yamaha motors in all their bike. Uh, from Giant, you've got the Giant Rain E, that's 160 mil travel, so a little bit bigger. Then you've got the Trance E, which is 140 mil, so that might be more your kind of thing. And if you're looking at high bike, they've got the Estuary Full 7 5.0, that's coming in at 3999 euros. That's a 150 bike, so kind of in the middle. I think our recommendation is get along to a test day, get some accurate info on the sizing that you're gonna need, and think about what size battery and the capacity and the type of riding that you're actually gonna be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, James King is uh, is thinking about getting rid of his car because he lives in the middle of the city uh, and can only commute seven miles to work, uh, do a bit of shopping, pick up his daughter from nursery. Uh, his wife has a car for longer trips. Could an e-bike fill in the gap? Well, absolutely. Uh, and I think this is where we should maybe bring the discussion about, uh, about cargo bikes in and trailers because they're quite versatile and obviously you get a bit of a workout at the same time. Cargo bikes are becoming increasingly popular and they're great for all kinds of things such as carrying cargo and kids and well all manner of things. Now we saw a load of cargo bikes at Eurobike last September. Now this is actually the Turn GSD uh, and this is actually designed to carry two kids a week's worth of groceries or 180 kilograms. Yeah I said it 180 kilos. I mean that's a monumental amount of weight. Probably weighs about I don't know two barrels of beer. Now even though it looks like a bit of a juggernaut it's actually about the same size as a normal mountain bike it's actually shorter than a normal mountain bike 180 centimeters which means you can actually fit it in the boot of your car now obviously as it is now it might be a little bit of a struggle to get this bike into the back of say a Peugeot 106 but a neat touch about this bike is that it can actually fold down to a third of its volume in a matter of seconds so obviously that means that once you've folded it up, you can take it on buses, on trains, and also get it into elevators. Now I'm actually blown away by the different configurations of this bike in terms of carrying capacity, because you can use it with a rack on the back, with a rack on the front, you can have panniers, or like I said, you can actually carry kids. This bike is designed for carrying two bike seat on the back here so you can easily take your kids back and forth to nursery. So what about its electricness? Well it's got a Bosch performance line motor on there, 250 watts and not one but two 500 watt hour batteries which means the range on this bike is pretty significant. Now in terms of anchoring the brakes on this bike are four piston Magura brakes because if you think about it 180 kilos going from say 30 kilometers an hour to a standstill does need some pretty powerful uh, braking system so there you go. Uh, in terms of lighting it's got a really neat LED lighting system which is part of the bike that's front and rear and obviously it's got a bell. 
But if you have an e-mountain bike already, there is of course the option of a trailer to bolt onto to go and get your shopping. Detachable, easy to fit and loads of room. Hmm, now I wonder what that's for. A flag. That looks like a big bag. Where's the dog? Where's the dog and we need her? Bye! Come on in you get. Just look at the size of this bag. It is huge. It must hold, I don't know, 40 kilos? <laughs> I mean, that is a substantial Welsh collie in there. I think it's time to get the bike um, connected up and head for a spin to the shops. Now, the, once you've built the trailer up, it comes with three different um, types of rear axle. Now, this is where you need to be super careful, uh, get, making sure you get the right one. So as you can see, um, this is the axle which has come out of my specialized bike. You can see it's quite a fine thread at the bottom there. Uh, now I need to match that up. Obviously, if you look at this one here, obviously that thread, does not marry up with this thread. There's a far coarser thread on there, but you've actually got one here, which is which is the, the correct one. So you line up the end of the, lined up the end of the axle, and you space it out using one of those spacers. That one there fits spot on. So the moment of truth. It's going to offer it up. As you can see, they, these are actually spring loaded. I think all I should be able to do is wheel it in and then offer it up. Boom. Now that is a juggernaut. What was it that Richard Harris said in the film? Sweet mother of pearl. And there she is, the Journey Trailer TX. It was actually quite simple to put it together. Once we had uh, all the parts out on the grass, we had the mudguard, the wheel, the axle, uh, the main frame, and of course the tow bar. Uh, and it went together in probably about 20 minutes after a little bit of faffing. Uh, so yeah, there it is, there's the dry bag inside. It fits to the chassis by these Velcro straps. And um, total capacity of um, 32 kilograms. Now I can, I can't even think of, well, I can actually think of the huge amount of adventures, camping, shopping, trips across continents, trips across countries, because the capacity of this bag is 32 kilos. So you can probably get uh, crates of beer, bottles of wine, tins of beans, uh, camping stove, tent, you name it. I think it'll all fit um, into this bag. How does it ride? Well, predictably and very stable. Although at first we forgot to pump up the tire, which sent the dog a little bit dizzy. But as you can see, we got it sorted and it pulls a treat. So there they go then, the Journey Trailer TX, uh, a great way to go shopping or on some big adventures. Well, that cargo bike looks a load of fun. It makes me want to get rid of my car and get one of those things. Maybe that doctor should get one of those, Steve, and actually do all the runs with all the medical kit on the back. That would be the ticket for her, for sure. Yeah, I think it's quite, you know, it's quite obviously cargo bikes are very relevant at the moment in terms of, uh, of taking goods and people around the country. Definitely. Anyhow, next question. This is coming in from Christian Madison. He said, hi guys, can you do a video about how to stay in the pedals when jumping with flat pedals? I'm coming from clip pedals. I love my flats, but I'm losing grip on small jumps. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind, over to you on that one. Uh, jumping's not really my thing, but uh, I'm sure you can tell uh, how to do it. Yeah, for sure. I think as a common question, actually, a lot of people coming from clips to flats get used to pulling the bike up with their cleats and like pulling the bike up in the air is not good. What you really need to be doing is actually squashing down into the bike. So you're really preloading and pushing your feet into the bike and keeping those feet in contact as the bike rises. A really good way of doing this is just to get in the car park and just squash your suspension. And just try and get, you know, in time with the bike suspension. If you're out of time, you're gonna be leaving the lip before the bike does, and that's why you're leaving the actual pedals. Other things you might wanna check is gonna be your footwear as well. You know, you want some proper footwear, something like the 510s or the Specialized shoes, that sticky rubber and some nice flat pedals with some good pins on would definitely make all the difference. Just make sure you're wearing a bit of shin protection. 
Chris, do you think uh, do you think suspension setup is quite important as well? Obviously, maybe maybe you can get something with a little bit faster rebound rather than slow rebound. And I guess the other thing is is work on your timing as well, right? Yeah, and, and it's all about practicing it. Yeah, it's all about practice. And I think that thing you mentioned about suspension, Steve, is definitely key. I think if you've got a bike with quite slow rebound, you're going to be sort of that bike's going to stick to the ground a lot, you know, slower than something with a bit of rebound that's going to ping the bike up. So have a look at your suspension settings, get that footwear dialed, and just get practicing. Yeah. Uh, now Dan Bender is, is thinking about buying a Cannondale Habit 6, an ALSX 2017, brand new for $899. Uh, he's thinking of putting on a Bafang mid-drive and wants to know what our thoughts are on that. Now, uh, the model, this model Cannondale seems to have a bit of space for battery and is looking at um, doing some beginners level riding. Uh, he's looking at a thousand watt hour kit and weighs in at 185 pounds. Should he go for the 750 watts? Should he actually go for the Bafang kit? Uh, Chris, now obviously I know you've been doing a lot of, uh, of uh, what's the word, tinkering with uh, bolt-on motors. I mean, I've ridden the Bafang kits and, and they're super silent. I think they're incredibly reliable and a huge amount of range there. I think possibly, uh, you know, you need to think about how much, you know, you're going to be using the bike on the road at all. Obviously, there's legalities around that. But, uh, Chris, give us a bit of an insight into what you feel about about uh, mid-drive bolt-on motors. Yes. So, I think the cost of the bike is a big factor in this. So, the bike you're saying you're going to use is $899. The kit you're going to use, that's coming in at about $1,000 to $1,500 with the battery. So, you're talking around sort of two two k for the minimum that you're going to spend on that build and I think you're so close to an off-the-shelf kind of e-bike price you might be better off with that I think it's a really good option if you want to kind of electrify an old bike you've got in the shed but spending that sort of money on a new bike and that kit I think you know there's always going to be things that can potentially go wrong with that kit you're not going to have the warranty of those off the bike you know off the peg e-bikes that you can buy in the shop things like how weatherproof they are, how reliable it's gonna be, how it rides. There's all those little things, you know, that can go wrong with those kits. They are great, as I say, for an older bike, but for me personally, I would go for that off-the-shelf e-bike every time at that kind of price. Yeah, I think I think another thing to think about is also how, you know, how, how good are you at electrics? And obviously you need to be, you need to be tuned into this because obviously there's charging and fitting things. There's a lot of electrical things, you know, there's a fire hazards possibly. Um, but you know, like like you said, there's some great off-the-shelf bikes there. Decathlon do a bike for 1,500 euros with a mid-drive motor, you know, Bros motor with a 500 watt-hour battery, all integrated. Uh, you know, high bike to a hardtail for I think around about 1,800 euros. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, th that bike comes in. You know, that price. That is something that you simply can't miss. I think you've got all those components ready to go off the shelf. You've got the warranty in place. You've got a battery that's going to be safely fixed. You know, you've got a motor that's going to work come rain or shine. All those electrical connections out the factory sealed. It's going to be super reliable. It's going to be a bike you can ride literally every time you want to go ride it. Those home build kits, sometimes they let you down. Sometimes the battery is going to rattle around. It all depends on your usage, really. But as I say, I think that off this peg e-bike every time. Wow, rain or shine, eh? Uh, well, it seems to be uh, it seems to be closing in a bit here in Wales. Uh, now, Simon Alliston is is asking about uh, his Lapier Overfold uh, XE500 2018, and thinks thinking about changing from a 15 tooth chainring up front to a 20 tooth. Now, he's asking if you recommend this or should he just leave it alone. Ooh. Well, I think that is a massive jump. I think if you're on a 15 tooth chain ring at the front, going to a 20, that's obviously five teeth more. So that is a huge, huge jump. Increasing the size of the front chain ring is obviously gonna increase your top speed, but what it does is gonna take away that hill climb ability as well. You're not gonna be able to spin that motor up quite as well as you will do on that smaller chain ring. So I'm asking the question, why you actually want to change that? Is it to increase that top speed? Because I'm guessing this actual chain ring is on a Bosch generation three motor. So there is quite a lot of resistance on those motors above the limiter. So increasing that chain ring size, I don't think personally is gonna be a good move for you. It's just why you want to do that really, you know? And I think if you're just on about replacing that chain ring itself, it can become quite costly because if your chain ring's worn, you're going to get chain suck on there. You're going to have loads of things. So you might have to end up replacing your chain, your cassette and the chain ring. So it is quite costly for maybe not a lot of gain. 
Yeah, actually, uh, we've done a video about changing the, ch the front chainring on your bike and the, and the effect it has on your climbing ability. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you might want to uh, have a look at this one. However, we have the results in, and I can tell you that they really are not what we expected. The first runs were done with a 16 tooth front sprocket. So first up, I was in 16.42 on the back, and obviously I could not get up the hill climb. Remember, I'm in turbo mode for all these hill climbs. The second run, 16 tooth up front, 48 tooth on the rear, just about couldn't manage to get up that hill climb. So we went back, had a bite to eat, swapped out to a 14 tooth front sprocket. The first run was 14 up front, 42 in the rear, and by God, it was up, went up there, absolute dream. It was an easy hill climb. So what we didn't show you on that first, on the first run there when we were in 14.48 is that I actually didn't get up the hill in the actually lowest gear possible. So it asked so many questions. Uh, now Gaz Dando uh, says he loves the channel. That's very kind, Gaz, nice one. Uh, I've recently moved to the area and would love to go and explore some new trails. What is the best way of finding them? Well, I think maybe the first port of call is a reliable local who knows the trails and knows the sort of the local situation in terms of parking and, and access and such things as that. Cause you know, it could be on, some of the trails could be on private land. They could be on public land. Uh, and maybe another way is actually simply to just go wandering around on your e-bike. As long as that's on, on uh, legal routes, then it's a, it's a great way. It's all a bit of, bit of a mystery involved in it. I think, Chris, what do you say? Yeah, I think it's a good way of doing it, like you said, Jones, but I think there's other ways out there as well. I think Strava, getting on the heat maps, looking at the local trails that a lot of people are riding. Obviously, you've got Commute. Um, I mean, with Commute, you can download an actual route that you can plan. It's going to take you off-road, all the local trails, download the actual Garmin and just go and tread. But as you mentioned, maybe heading to the local bike shop is a good option to, you know, get those guys a coffee and go and chat about the local trails. Talk to the local riders if you see someone out on the roads, you know, have a speak to them. They should tell you where the decent trails are. Don't forget, if you guys have got any questions that you want to ask us here at EMBN, get involved in the comments box down below, hashtag AskEMBN, and it could be you on next month's show. Anyway, last question, and this one is coming in from Gustav Krako. He's saying, I see you guys regularly fly to exotic sunny locations with e-bikes. How do you manage this with the batteries in your bikes? Yes, absolutely, Gustav. We are quite fortunate in some of the places we get to. Uh, only recently we flew out to southern Spain and we uh, met up with Switchbacks Mountain Bike, which actually we were able to rent some batteries. They do uh, specialized batteries, high bike batteries, and also Shimano batteries. Um, what we do tend to do is actually remove the battery from our e-bikes before we leave. Now, it might sound obvious, but we've actually forgotten to do it on some occasions. Put them in a bike bag. Remember that uh, there's a weight limit depending on whatever airline you're flying with. I think on EasyJet it's 32 kilos. So uh, be you know be careful how much you put in your bike bag. And then it's simply a case of getting on the plane, getting your location, sticking the bike in the van when you get to the other end, and uh, and get to wherever you're going riding. It's a really easy and stress-free free way of traveling with your e-bike. Uh, now obviously things have changed a little bit in recent months with the introduction of the special specialized Levo SL, which has got a 160 watt hour range extender, which means you can actually travel with that range extender in your hand luggage, actually. Uh, but that's it. Uh, let us know your thoughts on, on cargo e-bikes and trailers. I'm sure you know somebody who's actually using a cargo bike for their work or indeed uh, using one to transport their children around and about during these quite difficult times. Uh, Chris, looks like you've got a bit of a better setting today than last week. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, I'm actually out in the conservatory now, Steve, so I've got a bit of a set going on, which is a bit better than the back of my camper van. But yeah, so I see you've got the nice weather as always in Wales. Yeah. But that's it for this month's show. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to EMBN and find us on social media too. We shall see you next month. Cheers. Hell of a set. Hell of a set.